about the mining sector uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, we have a really stellar panel uh, that is going to run through uh, some very uh, insightful presentations for you all. Uh, there are a few things that I wanted to cover in terms of um, the uh, in terms of the how the meeting will run. So first and foremost, um, please note that uh, if you would like to watch uh, this webinar uh, in uh, Russian or if you need a translation at any point, there is a button at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation. You can select in interpretation the language that you would wish uh, to listen to a translation to. So for example, if in, uh, we have uh, anyone that would like to listen in Russian, they should select Russian. That will give them access to an audio channel with simultaneous translation of the presentations. Um, it is possible that some of our speakers may wish to answer later uh, some questions in Russian. And so if you would need English at that time, please select English. But if you are happy to listen to the presentations uh, in English, which is the standard presentation language uh, for today's panel, then you do not need to click anything uh, related to that button. Let me also mention that uh, we will be uh, leaving time at the end for question and answers. And if you would like to submit a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type uh, questions that you have for the panel. Uh, I also encourage uh, members of the audience to uh, check out the questions that have been submitted. You can upvote questions that you would like answered and also submit your own questions. And I will be sure to um, basically get to as many of the questions as possible uh, when we uh, get to the end of the presentation. Um, now, I'd like to turn it over for some brief welcoming comments. Uh, first to Ambassador Tim Torlot, who is the UK ambassador in Tashkent. Uh, and then that would be followed by uh, some comments by Ambassador Rustamov, the Uzbek ambassador in London. And then we will proceed with the presentations. So Ambassador Torlot, I turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed um, to you personally, but also to uh, Eurasian Investor uh, for organising this event. Um, and, and a warm welcome to uh, all the participants. It's, it's amazing to, uh, to see the interest that this webinar has generated. I think uh, we've had almost three, 300 registrations, which is, um, for me, indicative of a serious renewed interest in the mining sector uh, in Uzbekistan amongst UK companies. So uh, an opportune moment uh, and thank you very much indeed. Um, at the moment there's very little UK engagement in the mining sector. I think um, uh, the early part of the 2010s, Oxus Gold and Rio Tinto were, were here, but both of those have withdrew in the, in the last decade. And as far as we're aware, the SRK who'll be consulting, who'll be uh, talking to us later on, is the only British mining business uh, that are currently active in the region. Um, and that's felt to us increasingly wrong, uh, which is why uh, we value this seminar so much. Um, as I suspect uh, Saeed Rostamov, the Uzbek ambassador, will say a little bit more, the, the, the mining sector is crucial to Uzbekistan's economy. Uh, gold is its largest export. Um, mineral resources in the country are worth around somewhere between 8 and 11 trillion US dollars. Um, and the, uh, the gold, it's not just gold, it's, it, it's uh, uranium, silver, coal, phosphate, molybdenum, uh, and, and lots of others, including rare earth metals. Um, for a long time, until really quite recently, this was a sector which seemed pretty much closed to UK businesses. Um, it remains largely state dominated and there's been little exploration activity since Soviet times uh, and at then at shallow depths uh, using old technology. So there are real opportunities here and the country has realized this and has uh, recently embarked on a major reform program in the mining sector which embraces privatization, public-private partnerships, welcoming foreign investment um, 
and opening up to private sector investment, which is really encouraging. The UK and the British government has warmly supported those plans. We're helping them in part through our involvement with international organizations. Uh, EBRD, for example, is helping the government to develop the new subsoil, soil, sorry, the new subsoil law, uh, which COVID-19 permitting uh, should come into force in 2020. And more importantly, we see real opportunities for UK mining companies and supply chain companies. Uh, DI, the Department for International Trade assessed that the outlook for the industry is good in the mid to long term, uh, with demand for metals that drive clean tech industry, such as copper, tungsten, lithium and tin. Um, and we see immediate opportunities here for UK companies, particularly in consulting and technical services in the beginning, the feasibility studies, environmental and social impact assessments uh, to equator principles, but also in the longer term to, uh, uh, for equipment supply, obviously project financing as well. So real opportunities. Thanks very much for participating in this seminar. Uh, I'm sure it'll identify some issues also that we can wrestle with as an embassy uh, and uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Rustamov, I turn it to you. Thank you, Smadiyar. First of all, allow me to express my appreciation uh, to you, to your Asia investor, to uh, DIT UK government, and of course to my colleague, Tim Torot, Ambassador Tim Torot, for support and organizing a series of uh, such kind of webinars on Uzbekistan that every time attracts a lot of participants. Uh, Ambassador Torot already said uh, uh, all the brief about the Uzbekistan mining sector. I would like, to, I would not repeat, but I just mentioned several points. Sphere of mining is among the core areas of uh, Uzbekistan economy. Uh, Uzbekistan has significant reserves of various kinds of mineral resources and of a number of them like gold, copper and many others. So we rank um, uh, among the top 15 countries in the world in terms of reserves and production volume. And uh, along with quite long history of mining industry in Uzbekistan, the government uh, today pays big attention to the further uh, development uh, of this sphere. And today there is a unified geological service in Uzbekistan, it's State Committee of, uh, for Geology and Mineral Resources that carries out state policy in the uh, field of uh, mineral uh, resources. And overall, over the past three years, uh, one can witness the large scale reforms and modernization going on in Uzbekistan. And there are a number of effective reforms and sig significant progress in the area of uh, mining as well. It includes technical, technological renovation that helps to uh, expand uh, the number of minerals that can be used for exploration, improve the quality of analysis of discovery minerals using widespread international uh, systems like in the global mapper and so on and so on to conduct highly precise or highly accurate uh, research of mineral de deposits in large areas and depths. It also includes strengthening the scientific and educational base. Uh, so just recently we established the University of Geological Science in Uzbekistan. And of course it includes cooperation with foreign institutions. And uh, one of the main and very important issues is improving the transparency of this is a, of the sector and raising the standards and attractiveness for the sphere uh, of uh, for the foreign investors. So the strategy for the development of the mineral resources base of Uzbekistan has been developed together with uh, BCG, its Boston Consulting Group, that among uh, many things includes uh, implementation of modern international standards and international best practices. It's government strategy, uh, briefly, uh, to increase mining uh, of gold, silver, and other metals and, um, and minerals. So this, along with Uzbekistan, uh, with all this modernization going on in Uzbekistan, it's also uh, brings 
we would like to bring such international standards like JORC, for example, and it, it's, it, we think that it will open the new opportunities for foreign businesses. So we have a good composition of speakers today representing government, business and experts. Let me conclude by saying that Uzbekistan would be glad to see uh, in the country and the work with British and uh, international companies in the sphere of mining. And uh, we are hardly working of creating of any favorable conditions for foreign businesses. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, common themes here with some of the other uh, webinars we've done around the kind of open opportunity and the ability to bring in, uh, hopefully with foreign investment, new processes, new technology, new standards to unlock some potential. But I think, you know, there's some big questions, particularly for a capital intensive sector like mining uh, that uh, foreign investors have to deal with. We will now turn to a presentation by uh, Simon Glancy, who's going to look at how the sector uh, has attracted foreign investment in recent years and, and what some of the uh, challenges and opportunities might be. We will then turn to a presentation from uh, Mr. Agzam Kadir Khojaev, uh, who's the Deputy Chairman of the State Committee on Geology and Mineral Resources, who will expand on some of the strategy elements that Ambassador Rustamov uh, just spoke about. So Simon, I'm going to share uh, my screen and raise your presentation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hopefully uh, you can see it in a moment. Can you see that? Uh, just if you click through, yeah, so we're on the title page. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, can I first thank the various British and Uzbek sponsors of this event who have been instrumental in making it happen? Uh, I think that's important to acknowledge. Um, in my presentation, I want to cover several topics I hope will be of interest to UK business. Firstly, a brief review of the Uzbek state's investment priorities for the mining industry. Secondly, details of what foreign mining projects are already underway and planned. Thirdly, analysis of the state agency Goscom Geologia's procurement plan for 2020 to 2021 and details of the new state geological sciences university, which the Uzbek ambassador has just referred to. Finally, I want to share some views on what we see as the challenges and opportunities for doing business in the Uzbek mining industry. If you can click to the next slide, please. Can you go to the next? Oh, thank you. Um, this slide describes the Uzbek state's key investment priorities for the mining industry using data published in the State Investment Strategy 2020 to 2022, which was approved in January of this year. Overall, mining represents 14% of all expected foreign direct investment and credits into Uzbekistan over that period. Most of the planned foreign investment in mining is concentrated on Amalek and Navoi, Uzbekistan's two national mining groups. Over the next three years, the Uzbek state aims to secure up to $4.8 billion in loans from both foreign and domestic financial institutions to finance the modernization and expansion of their facilities. Speakers from SFI and Navoi will no doubt refer to these plans in their presentations. Next slide, please. Can you, can you click through? Thanks. Uh, this slide summarizes the six foreign mining projects currently underway in Uzbekistan. The total project value is $530 million with $20 million committed in 2020. By far the largest of these is the $400 million investment by the French group Orano to explore new uranium deposits and rework existing ones from 2019 to 2028. Meanwhile, the Chinese mining group Richland International is investing $100 million to extract graphite from 2020 to 2025. As of today, most investments are small scale and focused on geological exploration. These companies are very much first movers. Most committed to the market in 2018 or 2019 before all the ongoing mining reforms had come into effect. Given the increased pace of legislative reform, creating a more favorable foreign investor climate in the past year. We expect the rate of new entrants and the scale of their investments to increase in 2021 post-COVID. If we can click through to the next slide. 
As for the state investment strategy, there are two foreign investor projects which are currently in negotiation with Goscom Geologia. This information, again, is based on the uh, state investment strategy 2020 to 2022, released in January of this year. The first of these is Chalik Holding from Turkey, who aim to invest $10 million in geological exploration for gold and copper in the Navoi and Jizak regions, and the $300 million joint investment by India's Sun Group and Shindong Resources of Korea to explore and mine tungsten in the Navoi region. Sun Group is an Indian private equity fund focused on emerging markets with investments including mining. It already invests in Russia. Shindong Resources is part of the Shindong Corporation, a Korean holding group that quarries limestone in Korea. In this venture, both partners intend to import tungsten mined in Uzbekistan to Korea. If we move on to the next slide, please. I now want to turn to potential business opportunities for British business to deal with Goscom Geologia, Uzbekistan State Geology Committee. This slide gives a high level breakdown of Goscom Geologia's procurement budget for 2020 to 2021. Uh, the total amount is $233 million, which is set out in a presidential decree of the 23rd of July, 2019. These figures may have been adjusted since then in line with overall changes to the state budget made in May 2020, but nonetheless, they're, uh, I think, a useful indicator of some of the opportunities for British business in engaging with uh, Goscom Geologia. If we go to the next slide, please. This slide goes into greater detail of Goscom Geologia's procurement budget for equipment over the same period. <clears throat> I think one of the standout points is that 68% of all equipment purchasing will cover ancillary services, drilling and laboratory equipment uh, in the next, in 2020 and 2021. If we move to the next slide, please. I think uh, I want to echo the point made by the uh, Uzbek ambassador that the launch of the State Geological Sciences University is a, is a very significant development. Um, Uzbekistan is in the process of establishing this university, uh, which will provide a range of degrees and master's qualifications, as well as conduct industry R&D uh, on the university campus. This venture not only involves a state led by the Ministry of Higher and Middle Specialized Education and the Ministry of Innovation Development, Goscom Geologia, the Amalek and Ave mining combinats, as well as Uzbek Neft Gas, which is a state oil and gas concern are among the other institutions involved in funding and designing course content and research programs. The university will accept its first student intake in September 2020 as an, and is in the process of finalizing course content and hiring staff. There will be opportunities for international academic and research collaboration with plans for international cooperation agreements to be finalized by this December. And to the final slide. If you click through. In conclusion, I want to highlight what we see as the key challenges and opportunities of doing business in the mining industry in Uzbekistan. Since 2017, there have been a series of major reforms to the mining industry and to the foreign investor regime to gradually bring it into line with international standards and concessions that make the industry more attractive to international investors. This culminated in major changes to the regime for issuing mining exploration licenses in June 2020 and the introduction of an e-auction system to bid for these. The reform process is still ongoing. The government has retained the ABID and its consultants to undertake an in-depth review of the Uzbek mining industry and in particular, standards of corporate governance and administration. We understand a report with recommendations will be delivered to the government later this summer. Meanwhile, in 2018-2019, the Boston Consulting Group has been advising the Uzbek government on its national mining strategy, and its recommendations have already led to legislative changes in 2019 and also this year. Another positive development is that more exploration licenses and deposits are now being offered to investors by Goscom Geologia without necessarily the need for an Uzbek partner. And there are 20 of these in total that have been uh, these investment prospectuses that have been released recently. Clearly the global effect of the COVID pandemic, volatile commodity prices and the threat of a global recession will have an impact at least temporarily, slowing down the flow of new deals this year. 
Nevertheless, the industry fundamentals are strong enough that we expect investor activity to bounce back in 2021, and we believe the entry of global players is inevitable between 2021 and 2025. There is still room for improvement. Current standards of corporate disclosure at local mining groups, by which I mean IFRS financial statements, annual reports, procurement plans, and the outcome of tender competitions remains poor. Addressing this is important in building foreign investor confidence and their willingness to make the long-term commitments to the market. In particular, we believe British companies require a far better understanding from Uzbek mining operators about what are the contracting opportunities. <laughs> The last point I want to mention is the growing impact of Russia as arguably the most active foreign investor in the mining industry in Uzbekistan. The announcement in May this year that the Turkish Russian group Renaissance Holdings, which is a Turkish company, and Renaissance Heavy Industries, which is Russian, were selected as the lead contractor in a $1.2 billion investment to build a new copper, gold, and silver processing plant for Armalik. And the recent appointment of Butter Hajayev, a former economics and industry minister and a former member of the State Commission for Implementing State Reforms in the Mining and Metallurgy industry, to be the new head of Roskiologia's Uzbek subsidiary, suggests that Russia wants to be a leading investor in mining, as is already the case in the oil and gas industry, where Luke Oil, Gazprom and its affiliated contractors are, are key players. Therefore, British firms may need to consider forming alliances with these groups as one possible route to market, as well as to develop much closer links with Amalek and Navai. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so it sounds to me like in, in really the pieces are being put into place uh, for uh, foreign investors. We're at a stage still mostly of exploration, mostly of small projects. And as you said, there needs to be clarity on the contracting opportunities. Yep. Well, we're fortunate to turn now to uh, <laughs> Mr. Agzam Kadir Khojaev, who will be giving a presentation uh, on behalf of uh, the State Committee uh, of the Republic of Uzbekistan on Geology and Mineral Resources, which Simon uh, just referred to uh, on several occasions. Um, uh, Mr. Kadir Khojaev, uh, I turn it over to you to kind of lay out how your uh, organization is helping to lay out the strategy and what you see as the important drivers uh, for foreign investment. Please just let me know when you would like me to change the slide. There will be a small delay uh, before the slide changes. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's more than 170 almost attendees and uh, the number is still increasing. That's a good sign up. So let me express our sincere gratitude for all participants of this webinar and uh, for the investment interest to Uzbekistan, despite the, the pandemic and uh, the, these tough times. Many thanks to the Embassy of Uzbekistan in London as well and other organizers for gathering all us here in one platform. I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, let's go with the presentation. Uh, the presentation is about maintenance of favorable investment climate in mining sector and opportunities for project development. Uh, so the State Committee on Geology and Mineral Resources, shortly GOSCOM Geology, is a regulative government body that provides state policy uh, in the field of geological study and use of mineral resources, database of geological information, and state management uh, in the field of mining relations. And we conduct uh, also work on reproduction of mineral raw material base of the country, as well as uh, issuing licenses for uh, the exploration and mining. Uh, next, please. Uzbekistan, uh, as mentioned before, is among the world's top 10 by reserves of some important types of mineral resources such as gold, uh, uranium, copper, potassium salts, and phosphates. Uh, next, please. It should be noted that the country's territory has been studied in detail only by 40%. And there is also a huge, but still to be discovered, potential 
Uh, here you can see the halos of uh, different types of ore manifestations throughout the country. Uh, next, please, just a short information of uh, what we've done towards progressing favorable investment climate in the country for the last couple of years. Uh, as His Excellency Ambassador Rostanov mentioned, uh, we held the cooperation with international consultant, uh, Boston Consulting Group, BCG, and BCG developed uh, for us the strategy for the development of the mineral resource base of Uzbekistan, as well as the portfolio of priority areas and deposits for foreign investors. Uh, we prepared also roadmaps for the implementation of modern international practices, methods for improving the regulatory environment with respect to the interest and property, of, property rights of uh, investors. We also launched the targeted investment process with a plan for further action. Uh, the studies also were made together with uh, International Monetary Fund, IMF, together with uh, Minister of Finance. Uh, and as you can see on the slide, by the results with the recommendations of BCG and IMF, the royalty rates for basic commodities are reduced significantly. Uh, thus, uh, gold from 25 to 10, silver the same, copper from 15 to 10, and others. And in conjunction with the, the corporate tax, the total tax burden is quite uh, competitive. For example, for gold, uh, it's about 14%. Next, please. Uh, and also, they reduced uh, significantly the amounts of exploration bonus, uh, which is one-time fixed payment when uh, receiving the license itself. So it's just simply the uh, license fee. So gold, uh, after issuing license uh, in three months period, uh, these bonuses are paid. For gold, it's like uh, 23,000 US dollars. It reduced 10 times. Formerly, it was about uh, 250,000. Uh, for non-ferrous metals, ferrous and other metals also reduced significantly. You can uh, see on the slide. And there's also a mining bonus uh, that is license fee for mining license fee. Uh, it's one time fee fixed payment, 0.1% uh, from uh, the cost of proven reserves. Next slide. Uh, so, in the next slide, you can see our current investment projects with the cost more than 600 million US dollars. As mentioned uh, before, uh, we have exploration projects with uh, French Orano mining for uranium, uh, B2 Gold Canada for gold, uh, Japan Oil, Gas, Metals uh, Corporation uh, for uranium for gold, uh, Turkish Geological Survey, and uh, other investment partners. Next slide, please. So, uh, let me mention that uh, at the same time, recently uh, our government adopted uh, special decree number 403 on measures for further improvement, improvement the procedure for issuing licenses for the right to use subsoil sites. Here we are implementing the procedures of license issuing under auction base. So it's a transparent model of uh, electronic auction bidding where the winner gets uh, the license uh, in 10 days after the auction. We can also mention that, uh, uh, that we launched a new mining code for the country, uh, meeting the international standards. Uh, it's uh, starting from digitizing all geological data 
and implementing the best uh, practices as reserve estimation under JOR code. Uh, so we are preparing uh, the document in cooperation with European Bank, uh, UBRD, and planning to submit it to the Cabinet of Ministers on uh, by November this year. Next slide, please. Uh, here on the slide, uh, you can see some initial geological objects to be listed in the auction. Uh, so we prepared presentation materials and teasers for initial 20 geological objects for attracting potential investors together with uh, international consultants and financial institutes. Uh, the assets uh, are for precious metals, non-ferrous metals uh, and all others. So, uh, in a conclusion, uh, let me feature out some just key points. Uh, so, having on one hand a favorable investment climate, stable investment legal framework, strong support by the government, diversified mining and processing industry as well as infrastructure, and with the comparatively low cost of labor, and energy resource resources on the other hand uh, with of course a uh, rich mineral uh, raw base Uzbekistan is uh, your destination to invest thank you uh, I finished my presentation here, here are our contacts please be free to contact at any time thank you Thank you, Mr. Kadir Khodraev. Um, let me add for the uh, attendees that um, we will be making the presentations available uh, most likely tomorrow or the day after. So you will have access to this information. And I know that Mr. Kadir Khodraev uh, and his team um, are ready uh, to have any conversations uh, following this webinar. And I'd be happy to also make an introduction. Um, so we have just heard that you know the uh, government is taking the important steps to basically uh, create a more favorable investment environment. But of course, foreign investors and also technology providers or service providers are going to want to know whether or not uh, the, the legal reforms and other attendant reforms are actually making the right impact. And so we're fortunate now to turn to uh, Olga Ponkratova, who's the deputy CEO at the Navoi uh, Mineral and Metallurgy Combine, one of the largest uh, mining projects in the country. And she will be uh, talking a little bit about the steps that her company uh, has been taking to uh, basically restructure in line with the modernization plans that we've heard from. So Olga, hopefully you will see your presentation on screen and I turn it over to you. Just let me know when you'd like the slide changed. Okay, okay, just maybe start from the first uh, slide, not from the car. Okay, just switch to the first slide. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, probably everyone, uh, or morning, depends where you are. Uh, thank you very much for participating in, in this event. Um, we, as as a representative of NMC, I'm really grateful to have a chance to participate in this discussion. We believe we are uh, kind of integral part of the uh, reforms taken in the country since we are the largest company in the country, like not only in mining business, but overall the largest company in the country. Uh, uh, NMC is a company of strategic importance for Uzbekistan. We uh, contribute 17% uh, in its uh, data for 2019 this year, probably even more, uh, to the country's budget. Uh, we are, we do, do export, uh, we're probably the largest exporter in Uzbekistan, if you count what central bank sells at the Gulf as our experts. Uh, we also contribute uh, 6% to Uzbekistan GDP. So uh, in brief, like maybe some people do not know what is Navai, since we are not as publicized as, I don't know, Barry Gold or Newman or some of our other competitors. Uh, we are sixth largest uh, gold producer in the world. We are uh, 
the company exists for over 60 years. We had our 16 years university last year. Uh, we uh, also employ 60,000 people, it's nice coincidence, uh, 60,000 people working for uh, NMC as of now. And uh, located in Navi region, uh, also we have some assets in Bukhara and Jizak, and uh, we obviously have an office in Tashkent and in Moscow. Uh, we produce over 75 tons of gold, uh, and uh, we have uh, ambitious goals to increase production uh, to 2026 up to up 30%, and it will be over 90 tons of gold production. So um, as of now, we are a state enterprise, which in the process of transformation, uh, we plan to become GST in the upcoming years. That's, that's something I'm gonna talk uh, next. So can we move to the next slide? So um, in regards of the, our plans, so, uh, I, I joined NMC in 2018 as a board member, like mid 2018. And since then, uh, we work closely with the ghost geology. They you know each other obviously very well uh, on the reforms. We work closely with Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Economy uh, on transformation of the mining industry, at least the state owned part of the mining industry. Um, Altogether, as uh, NMC, we were the first like an initiator of the reforms. So, uh, at the beginning of 2019, oh, sorry, it probably it was like end of 2018. Uh, uh, there was this, uh, yeah, probably beginning. Uh, there, there was a state decree, uh, the presidential decree uh, about the transformation of their mining industry, including Nawai, and this decree stated their ambitious goal of uh, IPO, the ma major assets of uh, Uzbek government, including NMC. So uh, for us, the, the target date for IPO is 2023. Before that, there should be a big uh, bulk of work with, which was supposed to, to be uh, conducted. So uh, we are working right now on the transformation of our state enterprise. And uh, starting from 2019, we launched more than 20 projects on the different areas of our business, including the initiatives which were mentioned by Simon, like transparency, uh, reporting, and et cetera. I will talk a bit more about it later. Uh, this is the transformation which we are doing in 2019. Also, since we are uh, we have a legal form of state enterprise which doesn't allow us to do the IPO, we are doing uh, we since 2019 we are doing our big work in regards of their transforming uh, state enterprise into GSC. We still have uranium business incorporated uh, together with our gold business and some non-core assets. So the, the goal is this year to separate uh, into three lines of businesses to create their early gold business, which is will be GSC and NMC. We expect it to happen in the upcoming months, you know, the latest. And uh, to separate uranium businesses, separate standalone business and our non-core assets. We are, uh, as a next step in 2021, we plan to issue euro bonds, uh, which will be done on the London Stock Exchange, which I think a very important cornerstone for our uh, transformational process. And I think it's, it's a milestone that will be highly uh, it's, it's, it's noticed by their foreign investors and the companies. And uh, uh, in, as I said, in 2023, we are aiming to, to go with IPO. It doesn't stop us from investing. We are working very hard on our, uh, as I said before, our uh, production increase program, uh, like increasing this 30%. So we have some financing needs, which we will cover through this year bonds deal. 
and uh, potential syndicated deal which we're working on, on in parallel and uh, IPO if possible. Can we move to the next slide, please? In regards of the things which we already done, so as I said, like uh, we started working on this uh, from 2018. Uh, as of now, uh, we are uh, there is a presidential decree which states the separation and uh, transformation of the enterprise into the three assets, as I said, including uh, including GSC and MC. Uh, we implemented IFRS reporting. We uh, we have uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019 uh, uh, agreed upon procedures with our auditors. We also have uh, their uh, balance sheet for 2020, uh, for the first January 2020. Uh, we uh, also working on the centralized ERP system for IFRS reporting which is uh, partially in place. We, we are, uh, the, we, together with the SRK, we are uh, covered with joint reports 65% of our resources. So we have resources and reserves identified as of the date for the 65% of our uh, resource base. Uh, we also working on the GRI report, we expect this for 2019, uh, we expect this to be uh, published um, uh, transparently in on their internet site. Just also like tackling a little bit their issues in regards of um, how for their English, you know, UK companies or any other foreign companies to get into their procurement business for us. There is a uh, online uh, database called Yaharit. Uh, I mean, we can share later the name for it. It's a state regulation for us and for Amalek and for all state companies to publish all our procurement needs on this internet site. And any company can join the tender process and can apply uh, for their tender. So like, I mean, I already seen questions in regards to this, like in the question bank. So yeah, that's, there is a possibility. Uh, it's probably not in English, like 90% of our procurement, obviously not in English. I mean, you probably do not expect it to be in English. So it's, uh, it's something you will have to work around, but you know, that's like normal way to do business in any other country. So uh, we also plan to integrate uh, Yeharit and our procurement system based on their SAP pro product together with our ERP system. So we are working very hard on uh, implementing the transparency measures and like moving towards our uh, expectations of their public markets in regards of their uh, companies of our size. So uh, also like we are very grateful for the supports given uh, by their uh, state, right? Since uh, since we started working, uh, the state implemented a lot, like several important reforms, which of course we are uh, tried to contribute as much as we can based on the expertise we have uh, in the area. Uh, as it was already uh, mentioned, uh, taxation system realization uh, is a big step for NMC. Uh, also, there uh, there were official decrease in regards of implementation of IFRS for all their companies, so JC companies in their uh, Republic of Uzbekistan is also very helpful for us since we already started this process and, and it's very convenient that now everyone has to move there, so it's kind of facilitates their transition for us as well. Uh, Jo uh, joint statement requirement. Yes, we work together with Ghost Geology. We are already providing them some information in JORG, and we are uh, anticipating them moving into their uh, accepting their JORG standard reports for issuing granting licenses, which is important for us since nowadays we have to run the two standards in parallel. So, uh, also, like, uh, can we move to the next one? Uh, what is important, which I would like, is some of the centers which we want to address is the transparency for our company. We believe that uh, for us to be able to uh, achieve our goals, especially in regards of financing, in regards of uh, entering their international markets, transparency is the key. 
So we implement the wide range of international requirements and standards in our company. As I said, we already did the JORG for majority of our assets. We already did IFRS and uh, uh, it will be publicized as soon as GSC will be created. Uh, we are working on GRI, we expect it till the end of the year uh, for 2019. And uh, uh, overall, ISR implementation is uh, the requirements of these are uh, integration of the principles in different areas of the reporting. That's something we take very seriously. It was ad addressed in the presidential decree, and this is something we work hard in our company. Uh, what is important to say that we work with a wide range of international consultants. I mean, uh, we work with KPMG, Deloitte, PwC. We work closely with SRK, we did several projects for them, uh, with them, and uh, uh, we do welcome all their participants from the any international like knowledge transfer to NMC is very important, we take it very seriously. And uh, we do a lot of training for NMC personnel to transfer this knowledge from the international consultants towards our in-house employees. We also have a competent people, competent persons in our uh, headcount, we hired these people so we can create some reports ourselves and sign it. But we welcome the idea of their new geology university. We do believe that there is a demand, at least from our company, for their com competent uh, persons uh, who will be able to create geological reports and oversee the drilling programs. So this is the initiative we strongly support and we are uh, strongly encourage uh, Boston Geology and you know other pro and the providers to work towards that. Can you move to the next one? So uh, the things which we are doing, why is it important? I mean, we do understand that obviously like uh, we are like we do not, other than IPO, we do not try to attract foreign investors in NMC, right? We stay into an enterprise, you cannot buy as of now our shares, right? We, we obviously will be happy if you buy it when we will IPO, but you know, right now it's not, it's not the moment. So, uh, but we believe that what we are doing being the largest company uh, uh, in the country is very important for overall kind of in, in investment climate since we are kind of pilot project for the country to demonstrate how uh, how the uh, how Uzbekistan moves towards the international standards and regulations. So uh, we think that, uh, first of all, since we attract and we work on financing our investment pro uh, program uh, through the international financial institutions, through this, as I said, bonds, syndicated loans, and other project finance and other instruments, uh, there are but basically spare funds which country can uh, use for social and infrastructure projects. Uh, obviously the Euro bonds uh, placement next year will create a very strong precedent for uh, any father, any like maybe smaller companies go into their international bond markets and uh, obviously like much more uh, understanding for international investors of Uzbekistan as a borrower or maybe even equity potentially um, uh, equity placer, player and uh, as we see the IPO in 2023 that will be a big landmark uh, for um, for uh, Uzbekistan, since there is no uh, companies as of now which are publicly traded in the international markets. So that will be a big milestone uh, for the country. So that's where all their initiatives I mentioned before, uh, we work uh, on them to achieve this final goal. So um, as I said, like all the companies, all the international practices, all their experts in uh, metals mining, like in you know, the top experts we're trying to attract uh, to the country. Uh, me, myself, I personally worked in Glencore and it's like one of the top metals mining companies in the world. So uh, we, I have kind of reached towards their top experts in the world. But again, if uh, some company wants to work with us, no problem at all, please contact me or uh, contact NMC, or as I said, we publish all our procurement um, 
each of our uh, purchase uh, purchase order in Yaharit and it stays there for some long time so any company can apply for the tender process. I think that's it. Um, if there is something I need to add, I'll be happy to answer questions. If not, then thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Olga. That was a really uh, insightful presentation. And it's, I think the way you framed uh, the Navoi project as a pilot for um, basically this larger kind of transformation, the detail that, you know, your kind of um, uh, pushed for the legislation to get IFRS standards adopted across government enterprises, a really interesting example of that. Um, let me add just briefly that uh, for everyone who's watching, uh, please do submit questions using the Q&A feature uh, below. Um, we have some questions coming in, but we will be after the next uh, couple presentations moving into the Q&A session. I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Azamat Shamsiev from SFI, uh, who is going to uh, give us the perspective from the other uh, really uh, uh, major state-owned combine in the country in Al-Malik. Um, and uh, Azamat, I turn it over to you uh, to sort of talk us through uh, how you and your colleagues are working through the restructuring of that project uh, and some of the financial considerations uh, that foreign investors should be aware of. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks everyone, you know, first of all, for organizing such an event. It's, you know, really insightful and really interesting to see, you know, uh, all, everyone basically involved in the mining sector in Uzbekistan. I'm not going to make a presentation, but I'll briefly go through, you know, three main points that I'd like to make. First, I'll give a quick overview of Almalik, what it's all about. Uh, second, I'll, I'll give a concept of um, private-public partnership of trust management agreement that we are working in Almalik. Uh, you know, it's, it's a really new concept that the government uh, created where you um, uh, engage private sector expertise into state-owned company. And third, I'll, I'll, I'll try to share the future plans of Almalik, where it's going and where, it's, where it sees itself in the uh, in next eight years to come. Uh, you know, just a quick uh, uh, overview of what, what Almalik is all about. It's the second largest enterprise in, in the country. Um, in uh, exactly two years ago, there, there's been a um, resolution of cabinet of ministers where Al Malik Mining Metallurgical Complex has been uh, transferred to trust management uh, with SFI. So we are uh, running um, uh, this enterprise for 10 year contract, basically with certain KPIs, uh, with, with certain um, Plans that has to be that have to be uh, implemented, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly give an overview of what these plans are. Well, I'll tell you what what uh, the, the concept of um, public-private partnership, as I mentioned, basically to introduce best uh, practices in the corporate governance into state-owned enterprise. Uh, you know, starting from financial reporting, you know, transferring to to to, to IFRS, review, you know, um, revising corporate governance. Uh, looking into you know procurement practices and uh, basically making the, the, the plant more effective, uh, you know, with, with a focus on uh, uh, employment productivity. Uh, we've we've we are, we are we've made uh, really good progress in the past uh, two years in in, in uh, uh, transforming Almalik in particular. Uh, very similar initiatives to to to, to Navoi, uh, basically where we are. Uh, made really good progress in transferring fully uh, into IFRS accounting. We've, uh, we've um, revised corporate governance, we revised many internal processes. Uh, in, by engaging many you know, international consultants. Uh, and we, we would also, as, as uh, uh, in the medium, to, in, the, in the short to medium term, basically going into tapping uh, debt capital markets by issuing a euro bond, and then by 2023 going into IPO. That's the plan. At least the uh, at least the, the, the company has to be ready uh, by 2023 in terms of production. Just so everyone is aware, we've uh, currently Almalik produces around 150,000 tons of copper. 16.2 tons of gold, 
150,000 uh, tons of, of silver and about 90,000 tons of, of zinc. In terms of financials, it is now you know uh, publicly available. The, the, the revenue of of, um, of Amalek is more than two uh, billion dollars. In terms of uh, our plans, uh, we could uh, the, the the plant has been uh, set with the presidential decree dated 26 of May. Uh, whereby uh, Al Malik will be implementing uh, one of the world's, if not uh, uh, the largest, investment projects uh, in the metallurgical uh, sector uh, in the next uh, eight years. It is divided in two in two phases. First phase uh, to be implemented uh, starting 2022 up to 2024, we will get uh, mine development for additional 60 million tons of ore production. And uh, the, the, the numbers that we are planning to reach by 2024 is 290,000 tons of copper, uh, 38 tons of uh, first metal, and 200, more than 200 tons of, of uh, silver. Total capex for this is more than $4.4 billion, uh, part of which will be financed by own equity. Uh, fund for construction development will be getting into will be, will be um, uh, investing part of the funds into equity where we'll, you know where these funds will go in, into financing of the project the rest will be long-term project finance um, uh, by international and, Rus and, and Russian Russian banks we are now um, working very closely with, with international financing institutions in, in uh, uh, realization of these financing financing programs uh, in terms of the second phase and key numbers where we are trying to reach by 2028 is, 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 uh, uh, is basically to get 813,000 uh, tons of copper equivalent. In, uh, in numbers, it is uh, the, the, the number that, that is outlined in the presidential decree and we're all aiming for is, is 50 tons of gold by 2028. In terms of copper, it's going to be uh, more than 400,000 tons of copper. In terms of silver, it is 170 tons of silver. Uh, that's the plan. We are. It's you know, it's 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 a very very ambitious plan. But uh, you know, um, what's what, what's what's important to say is that the resource base actually you know permits us to to implement these plans. And uh, you know, I think um, SRK being our strategic partner, Mike, I think will. will more insight on uh, on where we stand in, in, in terms of uh, you know working and upgrading the resource base by uh, jork standards um, as i said you know um, uh, as we are going into you know into into a new level of Almalik is going to a new, new level of development as we are planning to to enter the you know capital markets and doing all the right initiatives in terms of meeting all the and all the right standards there is a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of um, improving further operational effectiveness, uh, you know, financial reporting, and uh, you know, there's been many consultants, including from you know, with, with uh, British Frankel, who's been, who's been who we've been working together. So I think in terms of uh, future cooperation, into you know, the British Frankel is is uh, on the financing side. Uh, on the consultancy side, and, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we've, we've been working with uh, SRK, and they are considered as, as our strategic partners. So you know, we are we are open for uh, mutually beneficial cooperation. You know, we are open for for new ideas. We are looking for a really really big investment project, and in terms of financing um, and raising capital. Uh, and uh, you know, thanks again for, for for inviting us, being part of this conference. You know, really happy to, to answer any questions the audience might have. <clears throat> Thank you, Azamat. I'm I'm going to come back to you with a couple questions, uh, but yeah. I'm going to go uh, quickly to Mike so that we can round out the presentations. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll have about uh, half an hour for uh, Q and A, uh, and there are some very good questions coming through that we will address. So, Mike, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see it now and hopefully you see your presentation. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, 
my name is Mike Beer from SRK Consulting. I'm uh, looking after the Central Asian practice of SRK. And we've certainly been very active in Central Asia the, over the recent years, particularly um, in Uzbekistan over the last couple of years, helping out um, AGMK with uh, a lot of their projects. So I've been asked to sort of uh, talk about how SRK can sort of support the mining sector in Uzbekistan and what kind of services we, we might be able to offer to that um, uh, rapidly developing uh, market as we've, as we've just heard. So if we could put on the first slide, uh, please. Now, in terms of what SRK can offer, obviously we're an international consultancy and we sort of focus on trying to provide our clients with um, the expertise that they need to make the use of their, the best use of their own people and their own projects. So, for example, in the case of AGMK, they've got some amazing world-class uh, resources in the ground of copper and gold, and it's our job to make sure that the, the company makes the best of those for the, um, the well-being of its employees and uh, the country. Um, but also those investors, obviously, are wary of returns, and um, these assets have to work for a living. They have to provide a return on those investors that provide the capital for their construction and expansion. And um, you know we can uh, play a key key part in that uh, in that development. So I'm just going to give a few examples of the kind of stuff that we can do if people are asking the questions about like well why what what can international consultants do and what do they do and and why could they add any value why why do we need them? So I'll just start quickly with the JORC code, which is an international standard for reporting what's in the ground essentially. And um, the two parts of that, the in situ resource and then the, the mining, the mineable component of that, the reserve, uh, is what is a bit of a, a forte of ours in estimating those. And we've been working uh, with AGMK on bringing them up to standard uh, with the international guidelines, which they don't differ a huge amount from the old um, GKZ style, Soviet style guidelines they were using before. But they're just, uh, there's a few important aspects about audit trails on the samples that we just have to make sure they're following. And there's modern touches like the use of databases to store the data. So rather than having things in a big pile of paper, you can't process or access. We've, we've trained the staff at AGMK to use modern database systems. So a lot of our work focuses on skills transfer so that we build the capacity in those organizations to um, do the right thing for themselves and their investors. Uh, and that in turn allows access to bank finance as we've just heard from from Olga and Azamat that if you develop these standards people will appreciate what you've done and understand it and can put it into context and it helps uh, raise that capital from a bank it allows access to all sorts of international investors whether they're looking at royalties or they're purchasing the products or they're uh, buying shares so that could be as Olga was talking about eventually there's an IPO planned uh, for Navoi and the international standards help with that listing and it means that investors the world over can can really put those assets into context um, and also if there's any joint ventures required um, or if any assets are put up for sale those international standards are, um, uh, are very useful and we have actually provided some uh, some training to Goscombe Geology on understanding and appreciating what these standards are so I think that's a probably a quite a major part, and you heard from the um, from Goscombe Geology about their planning to implement JORC or its equivalent um, instead of the, the Soviet-style system going forward. So I think that's a very positive thing because it means that the world is gradually turning over to these uh, standards. They might develop their own version of it, like in Kazakhstan has a Kazakhstan version of the JORC code, but it still is the JORC code uh, in all uh, important respects. Um, Geotechnical studies, um, apologies for the typo there. Um, one of the things that we can do is we can bring modern international approaches to slope design to some of these large open pits. And that means that the, the angle of the slopes of those open pits can be optimized so that uh, to recover a, a ton of ore, then less waste rock can be moved. And as you'll appreciate the size of some of these deposits, if you can reduce the waste movement by five or 10%, you're talking about um, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in, in uh, less rock that needs to be moved. And also it's a, a safer for the workers. 
and some of those standards used in Uzbekistan and other parts of Central Asia and Russia, um, they date back to the 1950s and they need to be updated with modern approaches. And that's something that we've been very um, effective at training uh, local companies to, to follow these practices and implement them. And that's something that we're, we're helping AGMK with um, going forward. So that's a sort of an optimization safety thing. Uh, another good example of what we might do is the tailing storage facilities. Um, in recent years, there have been a few failures of tailing, tailing, tailing storage facilities around the world that have caused a lot of loss of life and a lot of economic impact. And um, one of the reasons that you get these failures is because the, the dams, the facilities aren't engineered particularly well. Maybe they haven't followed the designs. Maybe they haven't done a thorough site investigation. Maybe they're built a little too casually. Sometimes the factors of safety they use aren't, aren't high enough. So um, we can bring the ANCOLD standard is a very common standard these days internationally. And um, when we apply those standards to tailings facility design, construction and management, we can significantly reduce the risk of, of failure. And um, it's not just tailings dams, there's water dams. I mean, Uzbekistan had a very significant incident this year with a, a, a failed dam. So it's very important, particularly in a earthquake prone region like Uzbekistan, to make sure these facilities are designed, managed and operated correctly because they can hold considerable amounts of material and this can cause a, a loss of life if it's, uh, if it's not adequately examined. So we can offer things like um, modern testing of the materials that really is more accurate about what, what the dam is capable of withholding and also um, analysis like seismic stability analysis which aren't common in the former Soviet Union by the design institutes. Um, and then lastly, uh, my last example is on the mine planning. Some of the modern software approaches that we can use on mine planning is um, allows you to optimize the use of those resources, whether it's trucks, for example, you can utilize them in the right way and make sure that you make the best use of their fleet. Um, just the next slide, I'll, I'll hurry up, I'm aware of the time. Um, just the last slides, I'll just talk quickly about exploration and about some of the methods. We, we heard about the fact that Uzbekistan is underexplored, which it is, and modern techniques require a lot of the historical data to be collated. And then you can use some of these modern tools like mineral system modeling, machine learning, using very powerful computers, uh, using some of these techniques like ionic geochemistry that can measure very low levels of metal in soils and uh, give clues to much deeper targets. Uh, it's something that could be applied very usefully in Uzbekistan, we believe. Um, next slide, please. And there's some more examples on this next slide of tools that we can use. So for example, there's different types of geophysics like Orion or PASIC seismic tomography that when used with the historical data and uh, the geological maps uh, to build a suite of exploration information, um, that's certainly something that could be used to, to find a lot more targets. And we certainly believe that in Uzbekistan, you've got two of the largest mines in the world um, already operating there and have been for some time. And there's a, a very good potential to find more of those uh, kinds of deposits, maybe, maybe not as big, but certainly um, some very significant ones are still waiting there to be found. So uh, we can certainly assist with that. So I think I've probably run out of time. Is that about right? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I'm thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. We're so we're gonna uh, have about half an hour of uh, for the Q and A, and I see a lot of questions coming in. Uh, so we're going to run over about ten minutes uh, to allow us to have time to answer more questions. So if you can keep uh, stay online until about. Uh, 12 10 London time, please do. But Mike, I wanted to ask you the first question um, that sort of touches on the last point you made, which is that, you know, I was curious to know how many or are most uh, the of the equipment, machinery, technology suppliers that you think are important for some of the exploration and modernization um, measures that you've just talked about. Are they, are those technologies and equipment available in Uzbekistan right now? Um, or is that something that itself needs to improve? Because I would assume that things like training and after sales support are quite important 
uh, for actually uh, getting this equipment on the ground and working productively uh, in projects. So what's the status there uh, for well, I think uh, there's quite a lot of in the market. You know, uh, the mining technology suppliers are quite able and they, they, they certainly get around with providing the sort of um, a lot of the modern mining equipment. Um, all the major enterprises are using generally modern kinds of uh, mining fleets. Um, and I think there's um, certainly software has, has been um, creeping into the industry. I mean, I'm more familiar with AGMK. Uh, than with NGMK, but certainly the computerization of mine planning has a way to go um, with software, but I know that AGMK is taking steps to to address that. So I would say that there's, there's certainly a very good start and a lot of the players in the industry that I've come across are, um, they know what's out there and they're ready to change. Uh, I think in some quarters there's some resistance as you'd expect from uh, adopting new technology. And, um, for example, some of the mines moving away from rail bound technology to rubber tired trucks. Um, they've sort of embraced that partially at uh, AGMK, but mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's more to go. And there's some good reasons for keeping the old technology. It's quite cost effective um, mm -hmm. and reliable. So um, I think there's quite, a, with, with, perhaps with the lack of foreigners over recent years, the lack of um, you know, expatriates work, working in those companies, that maybe they've been pushed not quite as hard as, the, as they could be if there was more private, foreign private sector involvement, uh, then maybe that would be pushed harder. So I think there's a way to go because much of the management is, or is you know, um, less familiar with that new technology and perhaps less willing to embrace it. And presumably that's an area where uh, British companies uh, can uh, play a particular role, either as being sort of the, there's a, you know, obviously a lot of expertise among, uh, you know, British firms around being those expats to help drive these transformation projects, but also potentially as the technology providers. Yes, yeah, certainly. And, um, and I think the private sector in general you know, that that will help a lot that you can't beat the, the nimbleness of the private sector. And we've heard about the uh, privatization plans. And I think that um, being able to sort of move, um, you know, perhaps move more quickly at some of the, the state organizations, it, it does take them time to, to move or to change. But with a private ownership or private leadership, we'll probably see that accelerating. And certainly with the other projects that we've, we've seen there, that they'll be very quick to bring in whatever technology is required, I'm sure. Another question that I, I'd like uh, perhaps Olga, uh, Azamat and, and Mike to address is that, you know, one of the things that um, I think investors will be looking at is obviously the cyclical nature of commodity prices. And in some ways, Uzbekistan is lucky to have gold as a major part of uh, what it's exporting. But I wondered if you could comment on what steps are being taken to potentially uh, invest uh, so that there's some value add in terms of what Uzbekistan uh, is actually exporting from its um, uh, mineral supply chain. So are there measures being taken either in Navoi or Al Malik to take the raw material that you're producing and then add value to it either within the domestic industry um, or within your own projects uh, so that you are somewhat more defended from uh, fluctuations in kind of the commodities prices. Maybe Olga, if you'd like to start. Okay, and since we produce gold and we produce already London bullion like uh, bars, I mean, not much any value to the bars you can do. I mean, uh, you know, you can pay something on them, but I doubt it's going to be it counts. Like so, um, so we already produce as much like as, as final product as it could get. Uh, in regards of jewelry, it feel like consider like going beyond that and like going to the jewelry market. We do have jewelry plant inside NMC. It's a tiny bit, like tiny small portion of our production obviously, since again, the bars, you know, it's a more like tradable commodity and it's just stored by central bank. So it's kind of like with 75 tons, I mean, how much jewelry you want to produce. So um, so that's, that's, I think that, for us, I mean, it's, uh, uh, we obviously like cyclically drive, driven like as other commodity producers. And uh, uh, again, in gold, since the, you know, one of the main applications of gold is like storing value in bars, like that's not, not much you can do. So, uh, but again, the market is very favorable for us right now. 
and like any instability in the world, we are contrarian to their uh, global markets. So any stability for the world, good for us. Since, as a company, I'm saying, since we are like obviously like benefit from the higher gold prices. And also, and as a, <laughs> also as a country, I guess, because of course- Yeah, as that, a country, you know, because we are such a big portion of the country income, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's totally makes sense for Uzbekistan right now. And uh, I should say this, in my humble opinion, it creates some uh, safety net for their country, which will probably survive through their COVID crisis uh, much better than others, since again, the main, uh, the main commodity they export is uh, the gold, which is contrarian. Yeah, I, I could add perhaps uh, in terms of Al Malik. Uh, Al Malik is lucky in, in, in a sense that uh, the ore is polymetallic. You know, gold and, and copper they they balances they balance each other in terms of pricing. So the gold, if gold down, goes down, copper rises, and vice versa. So in terms of this, this is a natural hedge that we have. In terms of value added, uh, the whole investment program that I mentioned about is focused on uh, going upstream. So basically to develop our own resource base. And you know, once again, SRK has been very helpful in that sense. And you know, our um, investment program envisages that we'll get you know, 150 million tons of own ore, which will give us you know, um, a full cycle uh, enterprise, basically operating from, from ore to, to the final product. So far, just, just, you know, just for information, we produce around 150,000 tons of copper around thir third, less than third of which is imported concentrates. So in, in order to increase margins, in order to, you know, to, 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 for, for, the, for the enterprise to be more effective, we are developing our own resource base, you know, with, with the main focus that it is, uh, you know, uh, fully integrated uh, enterprise. This is, this is our main focus in terms of value. Thank you. Um, I, let me address the next question to Mr. Kadir Khojaev, and then perhaps Simon and Mike, if you'd like to comment on this. But uh, we've talked a lot about the privatization efforts, improvements in corporate governance, and improvements in reporting standards, uh, both in terms of the exploration, but also from a financial standpoint. And a lot of this is about making the mining sector more transparent and more kind of bankable for foreign investors. But one of the attendees has asked a good question, which um, asking us to comment on the experience of cellular operators in Uzbekistan, another capital intensive industry. And I take this question uh, to be about uh, what happens when things do go wrong. And so basically, I wonder if Mr. Kadir Khojaev, you could comment a little bit about uh, how um, the state committee is giving confidence to foreign investors about their legal protections in the event that there are issues of disagreement around uh, projects and around uh, contractual terms um, over the long course of many of these investments. Uh, you know, how, how have you been cooperating with, uh, for example, the Ministry of Justice to make sure that um, these protections are, are in place? The question. Uh, of course, this cellular things is uh, out of our competency, but at the same time, in mining sector, I'd like to mention that uh, by the law, uh, it is uh, fixed uh, the the stable. Uh, I mean, the the, the stable terms uh, for the investment uh, in 10, 10 years stability. Uh, there is also, uh, as I mentioned previously, we are preparing now a new mining code together with uh, EBRD. And uh, on this new mining code, we're also implementing the certain uh, norms, certain clauses that uh, uh, directed to directed to protect uh, the interest of investors. There would be special norms on that, and uh, we would also be working closely to the with the Ministry of Justice on on these uh, aspects. Uh, so I mean, uh, the rights and interests of investors uh, would be 
protected by, by the law itself. Thank you. Simon, do you have anything you'd like to add to that question? We have another similar question around just generally uh, political risk, which is obviously a, a consideration for uh, any company that's looking at uh, major uh, investments in a developing economy. Um, you know, how do you see that uh, environment? And obviously there has been a lot of uh, positive signals over the last few years. Mm. Well, I think, I think two things to say. First of all, I think the government of Uzbekistan has learned uh, a great deal in terms of the controversies arising from, you know, the disputes in relation to cellular investors back in 2016, 14 and much earlier than that. So I think uh, in the way that we've seen the development of new investor protections and very substantial reforms, which are, you know, driven by the need to attract top level foreign investors, which involves, you know, uh, building in a high level of investor protection. Um, I, I think things are going in the right direction. Uh, the government is absolutely cognizant that they need to get these things sorted out. On the other hand, you know, uh, this has not been tested. Uh, you know, we haven't had in the last 12, 24 months, uh, aside of perhaps one case, of a serious dispute between, you know, a global investor and the government of Uzbekistan. So even though some of this legislation is in place and some of it is still coming down the tracks, you know, um, we will have to see uh, how it actually works in, in practice. But, you know, generally speaking, I'm looking at things quite positively. I, th I, th I think absolutely, you know, the government realizes that it needs to have strong investor protections if it's going to achieve these critical strategic goals, whether it's in mining or any other industry in the, in the Uzbek economy. Thanks, Simon. Uh, we have a question uh, for Olga and perhaps for Azamat as well. I mean, you are both eyeing um, these IPOs in the next few years, which, you know, as you've mentioned, will be pretty uh, landmark events uh, for the country and for foreign investors that are seeking institutional foreign investors seeking exposure to kind of the Uzbek growth story. Uh, one of the um, uh, audience has asked, you know, when you talk about foreign listings, is there a certain uh, exchange that you have in mind? I would, I mean, I would assume that London is uh, per, perhaps top of the list, but, um, you know, how does that, is that something that you're looking at listing, for example, in Asia and in London or New York, or if, or if that's something that uh, is to be decided? Okay, I can comment for an MC. Uh, First, it's something obviously to be decided. We, since as of now, there is no, like, obviously like the regulation changes, a lot of things in the world changes. So it's just right now to predict where we're gonna list is kind of hard. Like historically in general uh, companies, like medicine and mining companies, they tend to list in uh, London and Hong Kong. I mean, there are a lot of companies listed in US, but it all happened in 80s and 90s. Therefore, like their latest trends is not going there. So they're more like stick to London or Hong Kong. So um, in regards of like our upcoming bond issues, which is basically connected since we go into London and this is something which is decided. I think, uh, I mean, again, the odds are, uh, you know, in favor of London. But again, they will, it, it will be definitely a decision which involves our uh, board of directors and uh, uh, it will be taken closer to the date. As I said, we will kind of dry run it with our bond issues next year and let's see how it goes at LSE. Azamat, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, yeah, more or less same, same same considerations. I mean, we're not we don't know where, what's the best place to be listed. But uh, you know, the the ultimate goal is to be ready for the IPO. IPO is not the ultimate goal. But, you know, mm -hmm. to be ready, we see where the value is by 2023. Whether it's going to be dual listing, whether it's going to it's going to be London, we'll, we'll see what the market is. You know, let's talk in, in one one and a half two years time. Excellent. Um, we have a question that I think uh, is important for uh, Mr. Kadir Khojaev and perhaps Mike to comment on. But one of the uh, uh, members of the audience has asked about rehabilitation and I think basically a question about um, the environmental sustainability of projects. I think this is uh, increasingly an issue uh, also for foreign investors who are going to be looking at kind of 
uh, sustainability and uh, corporate governance and responsible social responsibility standards uh, for target investments in the sector. Uh, Mr. Kadir Khodjaev, can you maybe talk about to what extent environmental standards uh, have been part of the new uh, sort of package of the uh, uh, mining sector regulations? And then Mike, perhaps if you can talk about whether your company has worked a little bit uh, any at all in that area. So Mr. Kadir Khodjaev, I turn it to you first. Thank you. So uh, concerning the ecological environmental uh, aspects, uh, all our exploration and mining uh, processes are uh, accompanied with this uh, ecological uh, activities as well. So uh, during the exploration stage, uh, there should be also submitted there should be also submitted ecological uh, impact assessment so th this document also uh, agreed accepted by the state ecological state environment committee of uzbekistan the the uh, separate governmental body uh, at the same time uh, we uh, as a license issuer, issuer uh, while accepting, while agreeing the license subsoil use terms, we also input uh, these ecological uh, commitments uh, to, to, to the exploration stage, whether it is mining stage, anyway. Uh, according to, the, to that, by the end of the exploration or by the end of the total mine life uh, mining, uh, there should be a special program, ecological program, a re a re rehabilitation program the, that states uh, that I believe fits uh, the international requirements. So, so the environment should be kept stable uh, after the use of uh, these subsoil land plots. Uh, the details, uh, we can provide uh, some necessary uh, governmental decrees, governmental resolutions on these uh, aspects. Uh, so this rehabilitation aspects exist and uh, is one of the requirement during this exploration and mining business. That's very clear, thank you. Mike, in practice, how is this something that you're dealing with with your clients to put them in a good position? Well, I mean, it's, um, you know, we've not done a great deal of work in this regard um, uh, for, for our work in Uzbekistan, but certainly we do have an overview from our resource reporting work that we've done. And I think the, um, the, the comment I would make about um, environmental and social issues in, in Uzbekistan, particularly related to mining, is that um, there's quite a lot of legacy issues associated with the, the large operators. And um, they've been following local standards and uh, which are very much focused on um, the, the discharges of the pollution that you might make. And they're not about necessarily managing the environmental and social issues the way that other mining companies might do it elsewhere. So they don't take so much, or they take a different kind of recognition of the social issues. So for example, um, AGMK, for example, spends a huge amount on looking after the community in Almalik on various projects, uh, social projects there as a big investor. But on some of the rehabilitation work that you might expect other mining companies to do, they've got some, some work to do on those issues. And you know, there's some substantial um, dumps and things that need need to be looked at over the next, um, you know, uh, the rest of its operating life, really. So I think the realize that when these companies come to the capital markets, if you list in London or Hong Kong or any of these places, the US is probably one of the strictest, is that um, there can be quite strong standards of environmental and social governance these days, the ESG um, requirements. So if you list in London, there's the listing rules, the Companies Act, and um, people have recourse through the, the, um, the capital markets, through the legal systems in, in the country where you're listed to um, seek 
damages compensation for if they feel they've been wronged. So I think that's one of the things that um, needs to be tackled by the state enterprises if they're considering privatization, is transitioning from where they are now to being in somewhere where, in, somewhere, in many ways, they're more vulnerable if they list uh, on those stock exchanges because there's more mechanisms. These days, every year, there's more environmental and social governance um, guidelines or disclosure limits. Uh, there's more investors. It's become a bit of a buzzword. So I think that's the challenge is to, um, is to bring those facilities right up to the, you know, absolute modern standards. So, I'm sorry, I may comment on that because it's just, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's coming to our, it's addressing our situation. So please I mean, do. Yeah, because that's, uh, you know, something, I mean, I don't want us to be misrepresented in this sense. So, um, Unfortunately, Mike doesn't work that much with NMC, so uh, probably you're not aware of the work we are doing. So ESG is very important uh, standard. As I said, like within my presentation, GRI is one of the reporting standards, which is uh, focused on ESG, basically. Yeah, and that's something we are, uh, work very seriously on. So we uh, started this work last year. Uh, we uh, created, like first, like just let's separate these two things. I think that's very important to understand. Social issues and uh, ecological issues. From the social issue standpoint, as a person who worked before for international companies, I have very good understanding on what are the social responsibilities, like for example, like let's say Barry or Newman or any other company, or let's say BHP or name it take in Africa or in comparison to what is done in Nauai, for example, in MC. This is, these are like two separate worlds. I think like we contribute to social issue like 10 times of what the uh, average company does. First, because this, we, are, uh, we are state owned, right? So we basically support the whole region and all the people in the region. Uh, and also because it's a Soviet, I should say, inheritance, because in general, in Russia in CIS, the companies are very socially responsible in general because they uh, have, they, like during the Soviet times, it was a lot of, um, let's say, state orders to take care of all the communities around us. So we build hospitals, we, we build on hospitals, we build on uh, houses, roads. I don't have any cemeteries, like anything, everything which was in our blockchain, we really took care of it. Our contribution to the social matters over uh, last year, over $70 million, yeah. So it's a, it's a big chunk of money and uh, we do, as I said, we do take it seriously. This is one thing. The logical part, uh, this where I could agree, like that's where we need to work on. So uh, ecological part is something which we address right now. That's why we are hired, um, including SRK, by the way, uh, to, but other team, it was Dave uh, Pierce team, right? Uh, to work on uh, our, uh, checking our um, reputation obligations, so it's called ARO, right? Uh, so uh, that's, that's something uh, we already calculated and uh, we do have understanding what is our responsibility and of course, we involved auditors to provide us, and we expect, we actually think already received the report of the audit of our ESG situation and there are concrete measures uh, which needed to be tackled before uh, we go to LSC. So as I said, like we do understand the, important, the importance, we do work a lot of this in this area, but what I do not take is any comments on the social responsibility. That's where we do, like I should say, much more than any country, like any company in the world, I should say. That's why we, by the way, separate our social and um, let's say everything which is related to the community or our support and separate, uh, let's say, fund which where we will contribute, right? So far, all these applications are part of our cost base. So they were like in our cost of production. And as I said, like they, we are talking about uh, up to $100 million of uh, contributions every year on the different areas like of life. We also know during the coronavirus, we do actively take part in uh, addressing this issue. 
because again, as I said, hospitals and uh, older medical facilities in our region, they uh, strong, they relate to NMC. We have our own hospitals where we like have to treat our workers since you know the coronavirus outbreak. So that's that's, so that's my response on that. I sorry, hope I don't hurt your feelings, Mike. I'm sorry if I did. No, not at all. No, I mean, uh, I absolutely agree that that was my point is that the social obligations that particularly with uh, AGMK and from what you just said, it's absolutely uh, the case. Um, But, um, uh, and that's like, as you say, it's a legacy of the often the towns, the mining towns that were created for those enterprises. It was very much in, you couldn't separate the town from the, the enterprise. They were, they were pretty much one. So you have to manage that legacy and it's, it's expensive to do that. Uh, now, my point was mainly is about what, um, uh, what might happen if you, w- when you do go to list. But um, it sounds like you've got everything under control at the NGMK. Thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> Um, you know, we have a few minutes left. I would just add to that, interestingly, that uh, one of uh, the audience members uh, is uh, Milana Radijovic from the UCL Institute of Archaeology. And this might be an interesting cultural uh, kind of engagement uh, for the mining companies. But, you know, there seems to be some really interesting research that could be done in the uh, heritage of mining in Uzbekistan, particularly that gold production uh, has been a part of the kind of uh, role of the country in the Silk Road uh, for hundreds of years. And then previously, there's a kind of um, prehistoric also tradition of metallurgy in the country. So just something uh, to flag um, that might be of interest uh, to pick up on later. Uh, the final question that I wanted to ask is addressed to uh, Mr. Kadir Khojaev and to Simon, and it's really about how we take this conversation forward. So, you know, clearly there's a lot of interest. There are a few technical questions here that um, I don't think we will have time to get into, but I'll just add for all of the audience, if you would like to get in touch with any of the speakers, please uh, email me directly and I will be happy to make an introduction. Uh, My email address is yar at eurasianinvestor.com. It's the email address um, that you would have received uh, the uh, link for this presentation from. But as a final question, I wanted to basically talk about how we make things uh, more uh, transparent and straightforward for companies that want to pursue Uh, opportunities in the sector. I believe that uh, Olga mentioned that a lot of the tendering documents are not yet uh, published in English. Um, And I wanted to also ask uh, Simon, uh, you know, in your uh, sort of efforts to research um, this, uh, the sector, you know, how do you gauge the availability of information for a foreign company that's trying to get their sort of basic bearings Uh, on Uzbekistan. So perhaps, Simon, if we start with you for your thoughts on that, and then Mr. Kadir Khojaev to give you the final word, um, you know, what steps is the state committee going to take to maintain this dialogue uh, with firms, uh, given all of the progress that's being made to restructure the sector? So, Simon, I turn it to you. Mm, Thanks. Uh, I think we have to compare Uzbekistan with Kazakhstan in terms of corporate disclosure and transparency. You know, what's, what's the difference between the two markets? Because we work in both markets. I think in terms of corporate disclosures and regulatory disclosures, I think there's still work to do in respect of uh, the Uzbek mining industry, the major players in the Uzbek uh, industry, particularly Amalek and Navi. I take the point that um, both of them are advertising on this new tendering platform. I think that's an important point to make. I do believe, and this is something which Olga has raised in her presentation in particular, that this transition to IFRS reporting so we can get a better understanding of the uh, the financial situation in the two big state mining companies, uh, a better sense of what their strategy is, a better sense of their operations because they're enormous conglomerates. All of that I think is in transition, but I would have hoped, speaking frankly, that it would have happened quicker than it has. Uh, you know, I, I would have hoped given where we are today in 2020 that we would have had more progress in terms of IFRS reporting and more, a, a greater level of disclosure than we've seen uh, to date versus Kazakhstan. 
in general, uh, in terms of direction of travel, you know, we are, I would describe it, Uzbekistan is in the sort of the foothills of development of its mining industry. We're in the first steps. There's been a tremendous amount of regulatory reform. There's been a tremendous amount of legislative change. And I think a lot of global investors have not really wanted to engage with the market until they've seen a lot of these legislative reforms roll out. And now, of course, the test is, as one of the questioners asked previously, how is that going to work in practice? Uh, so the jury uh, is out. But, um, you know, the, the sort of general direction of travel, I'm, I'm very positive about. But I think transparency is an issue. And this, I think, is one of the terms of reference of the EBID's work, uh, which is currently going on. So, you know, uh, there's room for improvement. But I think in general, things are going in the right direction. Thanks, Simon. Mr. Kadir Khojaev, I turn it to you for any final comments. I'm sure that there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes to improve the communication uh, with foreign suppliers and investors. Um, you know, is there anything that you'd like to sort of end on uh, for the webinar? Thank you. Uh, just. Uh let me feature out some questions uh, in order to, to have answered for them. So uh, I read a question about the license, uh, exploration license period. Uh, so the exploration license uh, is issued for five years with the right to extend it to another five years period. Uh, and uh, it was also asked that uh, is there any la land rental? So we don't have any land, land rental. Uh, as we mentioned before, we have a one-time fixed payments as a bonuses, as a license fee for exploration and for, for mining. There was also a, a question concerning the geological heritage. So indeed, uh, the region has a long uh, mining history along the Silk Road. Uh, concerning the protection of geological heritage, there is a special uh, cabinet of ministers resolution on uh, protection of these kind of cultural geological objects. Uh, and just uh, mentioned that invest, our investment portfolio uh, consists of uh, new exploration areas and uh, deposits. So in existing uh, heritage places, we don't have any exploration or any uh, mining activities. For example, for uh, protection of geological heritage, we recently launched a program, UNESCO Global Geoparks Program. So. Uh, on the base of this, uh, of some unique geological heritage place, we are uh, maintaining, but we are creating geological parks. So just shortly, there was also uh, a question about the uh, Kazakhstan's uh, implementing Kazakhstan's model of giving uh, land uh, for the investors. Uh, on the basis of uh, land tenements, I believe. Uh, in our case, uh, we are not uh, like proposing our assets uh, on the basis of first come, first serve, uh, because this model is mostly for uh, less studied, less explored areas, mostly for green fields. Uh, in our case, we uh, providing uh, the studied uh, in, in different stage of study, sometimes more detailed study objects. I mean, the perspective areas uh, with, with certain study and deposit itself. So our case is like uh, as, a, as an object, as an uh, separate separate objects uh, under the auction base. Uh, one thing also, there was a question concerning why uh, there isn't any British companies in uh, our investment partners. Uh, frankly speaking, we just started. 
uh, as you can see uh, the royalties uh, the, the climate wasn't so uh, favorable uh, but for the two three years uh, NMMC and AMMC also mentioned we managed to do many reforms uh, as, as you can you saw the royalties was uh, were rather high uh, and uh, the information the geological informa information was, was also uh, mostly confidential uh, but now it's mostly open uh, the information on reserves resources the coordinates and all other uh, details are now open uh, on our, our my new mining code, we're also fixing all these uh, aspects. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, this, uh, this webinar is also another effort to, to improve the situation. So, I, I just want to say that uh, welcome to all uh, the investors uh, who would be talking we would be negotiating in a friendly manner with everyone because we understand that we need to improve the investment climate we need to we need investment to our country to to be more uh, progressive so uh, you have our contacts at any time you can connect us uh, we would be available for your convenience 24/7 Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. So on that note, uh, I would like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, we will have the presentations, uh, a recording, uh, and uh, also a form where you can tell us whether or not you, uh, your thoughts on the webinar and, and give us some feedback. And that will be shared uh, in the next few days. Again, if there's anything I can do to help take the conversation forward, please don't hesitate to get in touch. A big thank you to all of the speakers particularly for staying a little bit longer. I know they have a lot on their agenda and uh, we will continue this webinar series. We're hoping to have a webinar on uh, FinTech in Central Asia in the next uh, coming uh, weeks. And uh, as uh, Mr. Kadir Khojaev said, this has been a uh, really dynamic way to keep the conversation going. And hopefully we will all be traveling back and forth uh, soon to, to have these conversations uh, in person. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a good day, everyone, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Have Bye -bye. a good day.